years old, she looks like a right scrawny rat there. <laughs> and they're one and a sixpence. And we had to pay an extra three and six to get in the Pullman car. Barbara boy. Good looking girl. That's why I married her. But I suddenly understood that memories are not shackles. Shackles that uh, pull you down, make you f feel sad, make you want to give up, make you want to just go away and hide under a duvet. They're not that at all. Memories are precious garlands that should be worn round your shoulders uh, and, in, 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 uh, and enjoy the memories and use them as a communication between the barrier between the quick and the dead. Andrew has done very well because... And I sat for the next hour and watched Muriel drown in her own body fluids. It was the most harrowing experience of my life. And it will haunt me. And I'll tell you why. Such was her fight for oxygen that her, she was sucking at the air to, and, and, and I can still see her face now, and her lips formed a perfect circle as if she was sucking through a straw. And then we had to stand in the car park, and uh, I had to watch as six strangers came out, unloaded the coffin, took her into the crematorium chapel, and the last I saw of her was the tail end of her coffin as the doors closed. Now, that is not what should have happened, but unfortunately, that's the reality of it. And that's why even now, I still uh, live in the hinterlands of desolation and despair. All the high hospital in the world. Right. That's where... I've received many gifts in my time, but the greatest gift of all was the total loyalty, the love and devotion that she brought to our long marriage. Well, it has a massive effect now and it will in the future. So what we're finding is that people are telling us that, that they are feeling more alone, more isolated. Um, that there's difficulty for people to access the support they was usually uh, want from family and close friends. So she's, um, she's in school all the time because she works... When funerals have been disrupted, when they've not been able to attend them, uh, when they've found they might have had to stream or see a recording, it's, it's, been, it's been more difficult, that the grief has been more prolonged, that it's been felt deeper and the loneliness has increased. And that's because when we attend a funeral, when we attend a memorial, when we remember the person who's died and we get to share stories with other people who care for them. It's our way of witnessing as to how important that person was in life and still is to us. So you're kind of like going like that? Or... So what we found is that often people are, are, pu are pushing down their grief, um, which means that then it'll emerge later. You know, that's called practical grieving. We have to cope somehow, and that's entirely understandable. But grief can emerge later. It can emerge through things like people feeling increasingly ill physically, back pain, stomach pain, uh, chest pain. But also what can happen is that people can become increasingly low. Uh, they can experience high levels of anxiety. I think it's a hugely grim milestone to reach and not one that I would ever expected us to see reach, particularly those of us who lost loved ones at the beginning of the pandemic. I think the idea that lessons wouldn't have been learned and we'd be here seeing even more deaths happening every day than we did early on is just incomprehensible. Uh, 
um, and we were calling for a rapid inquiry to happen over the summer so that the lessons could be learnt quickly and it's really hard knowing that potentially if that had happened many of these lives could potentially have been saved. To me his life was precious and I think every one of those 100,000 lives was precious to them and to the people who loved them. And it just felt as though his life had been treated as if it was expendable.